So I'm so happy to welcome you all to tonight's lecture series um, in International Development Studies. This is the last lecture of the series for this fall. And I'm delighted to introduce Elon Gilbert, who's a member of the External Advisory Committee for International Development Studies here on campus. And he has experience, I understand, Boulder, Colorado. Is that your alma mater? No. My alma mater is Stanford University. I did my undergraduate and graduate studies there, undergraduate in political science and graduate in uh, uh, applied economics, actually. Agricultural, agriculture was the focus of that. Uh, my association with Boulder is, goes back when I worked there on the faculty for uh, let's see, f three years, uh, and uh, then I also have been at other universities, University of Michigan, University of Florida. Oh, U University of East Anglia, so I'm... We've got all sorts of things in common. So I was a student at University of Colorado, even in political science, and I did a year abroad at the University of East Anglia. Oh. English, so imagine that. So this is really nice. OK, you can take over. You're right. <laughs> He's an expert in agriculture economics. So um, Elon's topic tonight, Feed the Future, and he's going to talk about the US Agency for International Development's flagship program in dealing with feeding the future. I'm going to stop him at about 10 after because we need to use the course coverage. So let me turn it over to you, Elon. OK. Thank you, Teresa. Um, oops. All right. We'll quickly go over the structure of the lecture uh, tonight. I'm starting with the central premise of the Feed the Future program. The acronym is FTF, so I'll be, you'll be seeing that. Um, I'm focusing the discussion on one country, Malawi. Uh, that's where I spent five months this year and another three months last year uh, working in two different but related Feed the Future projects. And we'll go uh, into the distinction between a project and a program. Feed the Future is a program, a big one, and then uh, you have a lot of projects under the Feed the Future program. So be, uh, then we'll have a review of Feed the Future. We're not going to do the short film tonight, but uh, we will, uh, I'll summarize some of the major points from that. Uh, then I'll go over some of the basic concepts. Uh, these concepts don't apply specifically to Malawi, although they are all applicable in the case of Malawi. And these. For those of you who have had courses in uh, development, either anthropology or economics or other, uh, other uh, disciplines, a lot of this will be familiar to you. But I'm going to try to bring it back to this uh, specific situation of Malawi or relate it to that in each case. Uh, then uh, we're going to have a, I'll, I'll summarize the Feed the Future, uh, results of a Feed the Future program review for Mozambique and Malawi. Uh, this is a very good report and I would urge you to uh, look at that report. It's quite revealing and I think the authors have done an excellent job in analyzing some of the strengths and a number of the weakness, serious weaknesses and deficiencies. And we'll look at some of those deficiencies as we go through the concepts. Um, it's not all bad news. It, I'm going to give you a quick summary. Uh, maybe that's the handout, I think, there, there. OK. Uh, you don't have to look at that right now, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what is called the Chithumba model. Chithumba means package in Chichewa, which is a major language in Malawi. 
And uh, it's an example of what I consider to be a success, or potential success at least, uh, from Feed the Future, which is not all success. And then we'll have an opportunity to, exchange, time permitting, to exchange some thoughts. Okay, central premise. Um, and you can read this, I'll just uh, reiterate it as well. Uh, this is the major idea of Feed the Future. Helping smallholder farmers is the key to unlocking the transformative potential of agricultural production and expanding markets to build economic growth and pave a path out of poverty and hunger. That's a lot. And there are a number of key assumptions here some of which I think are valid, and some of which the experience of Feed the Future to date raises serious questions about, at least in terms of reaching significant numbers of what I would say poor or uh, farmers who are in the, well, in the case of Malawi, are in the bottom 50%. So yes, this applies. But as we will see, it doesn't apply, I feel, to a significant number, perhaps as many as 50% of the rural poor. So we have an issue here uh, that is fundamental, in my view, to the basic success. OK, we're going to skip over uh, this, but I will uh, urge you to, those of you who uh, have access to the web, all of you, and can look at this at a later schedule, a later time. It's a film that gives you a sense of the countryside. It also focuses upon the current crisis in southern Africa, because you've had two years of crop failure. The last year was particularly bad. And as a result of that, you have large percentage of the, pop, of the rural population in certain parts of the country who basically don't have enough food. Not only do they not have enough food, they don't have enough seed to plant for the next season. Or they have eaten the seed, or they have sold the seed. So you have a situation. Ian, yes? Was the previous picture of the people's corn, do you want to tell us something about Oh, it? thank yeah. you. Thank you. OK. Yes? And if any of you want to have a question, just stick up your hand as, as we go along. Uh, OK, this, is, this picture uh, includes a number of important things. One, uh, these are women. They are selling. Can anybody guess what they're selling? Tomatoes? Tomatoes? Potatoes. Potatoes. Close. How about sweet potatoes? Uh, they're selling sweet potatoes, which is a staple food. And last year, I was focused, uh, the project that I was working on was promoting orange flesh sweet potatoes. Orange flesh sweet potatoes, uh, as opposed to these, look like white flesh sweet potatoes. But basically, the major difference is, can anybody tell me what the major nutritional difference is between orange flesh sweet potatoes and white flesh sweet potatoes. Big hint, they're orange. Vitamin A? Yes, but you're not supposed to answer these oh. questions. <laughs> anyway, uh, what I learned in the process of uh, this project was Vitamin A is not in the sweet potatoes, nor is it in carrots. Where does who knows? What don't we have somebody from who's a nutritionist? There's pharmacy. That's close, but I don't know. Okay. Anyway, long story short, what's in uh, carrots and orange flesh sweet potato is beta carotene. And beta-carotene is converted to vitamin A inside the body. 
it has to go through that process in order to become vitamin A, which then the body can utilize. Okay, we're going to run through a number of concepts, and this is, this is pretty dense, I warn you. And uh, we may skip the last parts of it, depending on how fast we go. But here, if you have issues, questions about any of this, just stick up your hand, and we'll see if we can't sort some of them out. Some of them I'm going to defer to later so we can get through, because this is pretty meaty stuff. Okay. Who are the players here? Who are the development organizations that do development? We're talking about Feed the Future here, and so I want to introduce the key elements. First of all, you have the donors, and in this case, we're talking about your, I think most of you, all of you are U.S. citizens? Oh, yes, from Japan, yeah. Anyway, um, so USAID, uh, this, is that a term or U.S. Agency for International Development? Is that something that people are generally familiar with? That is, they're spending tax dollars, actually not very many tax dollars compared to a lot of other things, but yes, uh, that is our foreign assistance program and USAID is the agency under the State Department which dispenses that money. Now, USAID, even though it, many people think of it as actually doing development, it doesn't. What does it do? It is a conduit, a funding conduit for this assistance. Who does the work? In terms of designing projects, in terms of the, a lot of the conceptualization, the programming, and the implementation, it's done by others. And these others are universities, such as University of Montana, research institutes, such as the research institutes I worked for, the International Potato Center, and the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. Consultancy firms, sometimes referred to as the Beltway Bandits, uh, and uh, NGOs, you know those, uh, companies, community-based organizations. These are not just international or not, uh, outside the developing world, they are also local, particularly community-based organizations. So these are the people, the organizations that actually plan and execute development. The donors, or in this case, the U.S. Agency for International Development, is the conduit. They make the decisions, but they don't think and they don't do. They don't have time for that. They hire others to do both of those. It's dangerous. Uh, okay, development programs and projects. Feed the Future is a development program, as I've mentioned. It is uh, in being implemented in a uh, I don't know the figure offhand, let's say about 15 countries throughout the developing world. Most of those are in Africa, a few are in uh, Latin America, and then there's a few also in Asia. Uh, the, as the name, I've already given you the premise, and you can, uh, the ob objective is to significantly increase food production among the rural poor in the developing world. The, a project uh, in the program, in the Feed the Future program, is composed of many projects. In, uh, in Malawi alone, and Malawi is a relatively small country, uh, I think there's about 30 projects. Some of them are very big, uh, the, this one, Integrating Nutrition and Value Chains, was very big, about $50 million over four years. And one that I did, the ones that I did, too, last year was sweet potatoes, and this year it's peanuts and soybeans. Uh, small, but, you know, my, this year was a two million, uh, $6 million program. 
Last year it was about a $10 million program. So both of those are relatively small, but it doesn't sound like it's small. There are a lot of resources going into these, and the significant amount of the implementation of these programs is being done by, in the case of Malawi, by Malawians who are engaged by these projects to carry out these programs. We'll return to that because that is a major problem factor issue. Concepts, secondly. Okay, this one is where it gets somewhat complicated. Incidentally, this woman is, uh, can anybody identify the crop here? I'll be impressed. Soybean? No. Soybean is on the ground. It looks like what you saw, bu bu no, not yet. Soybean is like, you, you, if you look at it, unless you're really sharp, it'll look like peanuts. In other words, it's on the ground. This is pigeon pea, and it's, it grows. It's like a tree you know, or a bush and whatnot. And you can see the pigeon peas in the thing. This one, one of the major features of this particular crop that is attractive for Malawi is that it pr grows and produces a crop even when it doesn't rain all the time. And one of the things we uh, will see, or maybe I, I think it was, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm going to go back just uh, quickly to that uh, earlier slide. Um, oh, yeah, th this one. What do you see in the background here? Who can tell me what crop this is? Corn. Maize. Yes, maize or corn. At least what's left of it. And this is a picture which shows you the problem that we've been facing in Malawi for the last two years and as intermediately throughout the history of the place. This crop has failed. This crop, and the problem with maize, if it doesn't rain, it's very fussy. It doesn't produce a cob, nothing, nada. In which case, you don't get anything. That, the, you can see, because normally, if they, when they harvest, they go in and break it off and break it off. They haven't even bothered with this. There's nothing to break. They'll just let the cattle eat it. So I think this is a, this particular crop, the, uh, does well even when it doesn't rain. It produces a crop, a good crop. Okay, let me go back. Okay, secondly, so first of all, now first of all, in the concepts in this section, value chains. Can anybody tell me or give me an example of a value chain from Montana? Can be agriculture. Wheat. Yes. Okay, but wheat is a commodity. Tell me a little bit about the value chain for wheat. Yes, it is a value chain. Absolutely. Uh oh. You were going to run away, weren't you? <laughs> so she's not. <laughs> okay. Can you turn it into flour? Yes, you're getting warm. Okay, that's part of the value chain. The value chain extends not just from the production end, but you start way back in the what goes, what happens. Yeah. You, you're, you, you, you. You know, you're doing very well. You want, I think you, you're going to get a good grade here. Yeah, it's right, it's right. Anyway, wheat uh, and any other commodities, you start really with the inputs. And in order to grow wheat, you need inputs. You need fertilizer, you need seed, you need credit, you need machinery, etc. All those things happen or have to be organized before you do anything on the ground. Then you plant, then you produce it, and then what happens? I heard it, somebody said it. What happens to wheat after it's already, it's harvested? What happens next? You sell it. You sell it. Okay, somebody buys it, and what do they do with it? Huh? Eat it. Grind it yes! Yes, they make it into flour, and then they bake it, and then you have it, you buy it across the street. 
Okay, so that is a value chain. That's a value chain. So what, for the most part, in a place like Malawi and throughout the world, most of the rural poor in particular do not participate in value chains in that sense as producers. They produce, they increasingly, and this is where it gets into a big problem, they participate as consumers. And therefore, a lot of people in places like Malawi do not routinely produce enough of the basic staple foods required for life. So they have to buy them. So they have some way to get the resources in order to do that. The value chain idea is central to feed the future, and that is to get more farmers to participate in value chains so they get money and they are able to buy things, including additional things for their diet, but everything else, including sending their children to school so that their children don't have to be farmers. Very important. Very serious. That's the way a lot of them think. Okay, so value chain participation is important objective to uh, in Feed the Future to get more and more farmers to do that because most of them don't, except as consumers and particularly in times of great stress. Resilience. Can anybody give me a quick example of resilience? It's cold outside, so we don't want to freeze. So we have measures to deal with that, such as coats. Now, in the context of peasant agriculture in a place like Malawi, what, do we, what, what, what might you think of as resilience? Ability to survive is very important because a lot of these people live very close to the margin. Ability to survive when, you're, when your maize crop fails. What do you do? And can somebody give me an idea on what you think they might do in the situation? These are farmers. The maize crop fails. What do they do? Think, I'm going to give you a hint. If you're in this class or if you're in 270, think back to the Peace Corps recruiter who was talking about um, her Peace Corps experience also in Africa and the idea of resilience and what they had to do if corn failed or if Yes, um, I think in a lot of these communities, the first step they take is to get creative to start invading something new. Obviously, what they've been doing isn't working, so maybe start talking to other communities or just trying to work with themselves to figure out another solution. Good, good, but uh, I was also thinking about specific examples. Let me give you an extreme case, <clears throat> Syria. What do people do in Syria? What are they doing right now? What have they been doing for the last two years? Leaving. Leaving. Otherwise known as, starts with M, migration. migration. Big, big issue here. So one of the coping mechanism is a term that sometimes use measures is to migrate. You leave the place. Now that's an extreme case. And in the case of Malawi, where do you go? That's a, a big question. There's not, you, you go from the frying pan to the fire. So it's, it's uh, uh, problem issues. They're a long way from the Mediterranean. So it's, uh, it's not migration, but migration happens within Africa, big time. Uh, and it's been there for centuries. But this is something that uh, USAID and the concept of Feed the Future before I was saying, okay, value chains are, are, are wonderful, but, and I'm going to tick tack on the next thing, relief humanitarian response. What was happening in Feed the Future is happening in Feed the Future still. You start off trying to get people involved in value chains to produce for the market, and therefore 
going back to your original, the premise that I gave you, they will be progress. Economic development will happen, the economy grows, etc., just as it did in this country or something like that. This didn't happen for a number of reasons, war, climate change, or just drought, and therefore you got into a cycle of relief and humanitarian response just to keep people alive. And also they found the significant numbers of people were not participating in the value chains. Why? Because they're poor and they don't want to specialize. And this is where you got into a real conflict between what people's objectives were and what was required in order to have significant participation in value chains. If you want to be and, and significantly improve your income by participation in value chains, you have to produce a fair amount of wheat or whatever, pigeon peas, soybeans, peanuts, whatever. If you just produce a little bit, it doesn't really change anything. So what's happening, what is happening, unfortunately or unfortunately, most farmers, because of the drought, because of the war, because of a number of factors, including the fact that they don't want to be farmers, they will, don't want their children to be farmers, they are diversifying. They're not specializing, they are diversifying. They're going in the wrong direction in terms of value chain participation. They're doing that to survive, <clears throat> they think that's the best way to do it, and they want to go and do something else or they want their children to do something else. Yes. So Elon, when you say that they're diversifying, do you mean that they're diversifying and planting various crops, or are they diversifying in the sense of sending a child to work in a city or something? Oh. Both. Can you Both. hear that, Stephen? Did that they are diversifying within agriculture and outside of agriculture. Their whole livelihood strategy is diversifying with the goal of getting out well, a gay goal of surviving. And it's often thought, they think of it in terms of one child is going to make it through. Out of the 10 children that I have, one is going to live and one is going to go all the way. And that person is going to take care of everybody else. That's the strategy. It's a roulette game, uh, <clears throat> basically. But that's otherwise. It's poverty forever. That's a lot of them see that as their only hope. So this resilience has come in as a major factor in Feed the Future because value chain was not working as well. It's working for some, but not as significantly as they hoped. It's a minority of the not so poor who are participating in the value chain. Surprise, surprise. The relief and humanitarian response was endless. It was just handing out seed. It was giving food relief uh, to people. Uh, this is another discussion uh, on how food relief is and, f and food assistance has evolved significantly. Fascinating story there. We're not going to have time to do it tonight. But the, the, uh, in between those is resilience. The idea is to improve and strengthen the basic coping mechanisms which farmers have, poor farmers have. And uh, in places like Malawi, the, it has only extended to things like crop diversification, pigeon peas as an example, uh, to try and find things that will survive even in the face of climate change and other natural and uh, not so unnatural disasters. Okay, next concepts. Strengthening capacity organizations, uh, strengthening capacity of organizations in human resources. This is an area where I think there's been major failure. I say that deliberately because it takes time and it's complicated. And USAID and Feed the Future do, and this is a real basic problem with a program like Feed the Future, 
It is tied to a specific administration, in this case the Obama administration, but it could be any, it's, it's just in the nature of the beast, namely a short-term time horizon in order to accomplish something significant. And in that process of trying to do that, all of that, this gets lost, strengthening capacity. It takes too long and you're going to be gone and somebody else is going to be president by the time you figure out where you see the results from this effort. But there are serious consequences, in my view, to ignoring that uh, dimension. There has been significant progress in human resource development. That means people. But the organizational dimension is weak, awful. And so when I went to Malawi last year and again this year, I looked at public sector organizations for agricultural research and extension, which were in far worse shape than they were in the 1980s when I was there. Worse shape in terms of numbers of people, skill levels, and most of all, performance. And these were almost non-functioning organizations, whereas they definitely had been functioning in the 1980s. Now, we're not going to be able to go into all of the reasons on why that's happened. One of the reasons is that we no longer have Hastings Banda, who was a dictator, in power, who Dictatorships have some positive dimensions to them. Many negatives to this man, but one of the positives was he made people go to work on time and he was serious about agriculture, very serious. Sustainability. This is another weak area for uh, the uh, Feed the Future program. Once again, it's because of the short-term horizon we want to accomplish miracles in a short period of time because we are selling this whole thing to a Congress which is very doubtful about a lot of things, including foreign assistance. And so we need to convince them by producing results. So you have a whole bunch of stuff and metrics which relate to reaching large numbers of people this season right now. But in terms of what happens in the longer run, uh, that's going to be the next president's problem. Uh, or he won't even think about it. He doesn't think. I mean, well, okay. <laughs> sustainability. Uh, there are two dimensions of sustainability. Uh, one is financial. That means basically can, you, can the programs continue? Do they produce enough um, income, whatnot? at the farmer level to keep them interested in doing this. They don't want to lose money. They don't have any money to lose. And also, does it uh, harm or do good as far as the environment is concerned? Or are we basically mining the soil? Or in the case of pigeon peas, which you saw, pigeon peas fix nitrogen. Does, can anybody tell me what the importance of that is? Peanuts fix nitrogen. What is ni nitrogen is a nutrient that is not natural the way phosphates and, uh, and potash are in the, it is created by lightning, it's created all sorts of ways in which, but it is consumed or it goes away. So you have plants, and this is one of the wonderful things about the plant world, where they create nitrogen. They create their own nitrogen. There's a process which I won't go into. So maize consumes nitrogen big time. Does not produce any nitrogen, although they're working on ways to try to make it to do that. So Pigeon peas and soybeans and particularly groundnuts or peanuts, they produce nitrogen which benefits themselves, that plant, as well as other plants. So there are things that can be done 
to make the soil sustainable in terms of crop production. Uh, one, one thing I saw in uh, an example in Malawi of um, went through this one district in the south and alongside often and you go drive along and you see uh, by the side of the road them selling something and that gives you an idea we saw the the case of the sweet potatoes in the earlier film well in this one district what did I see by the side of the road I saw charcoal I saw rocks or gravel and I saw sand I said oh wait a minute you sell the charcoal, you know, well, you know where charcoal comes from. That's your forests that they're burning up and it's converting into charcoal so that you use that for fuel. The sand and the rocks, and I say, what do you have left? A big hole. There's nothing. You know, they're, they're selling their basic natural resources. They're not selling food, they are selling rock and soil and trees that's what they're selling that's serious okay concepts all right now this is a great picture i love it this is i love this area in the background is mount molanji which is in the southern part this is a great tea growing area this is not tea can anybody tell me what crop this is okay here's a big hint no, Soybean? no, we've, we've seen the crop by the side of the road in an earlier slide. Yams or sweet potatoes? Yes, these are sweet potatoes. Now, this is an interesting one because what these women are doing, actually you can eat sweet potato leaves. They're, they make a good spinach kind of crop, that's fine. But what these women are, women are doing are harvesting the vines. Sweet potatoes unlike uh, soybeans or peanuts or pigeon peas how, how do you, does, you know, maybe somebody can tell me how, how do you reproduce sweet potatoes put a jack of the potato back in the ground no but you do that with potatoes you're getting warm you do you put the vine back in you cut the vine, it's a vegetative re reproduced crop. So basically you take a cutting from the vine, you put it in the soil, and it grows, and it produces. These women are working for a, uh, a large farmer who has become, is specializing in sweet potato vines. He's not producing sweet potatoes. I mean, he's fine, he's produced sweet, but his main function, product, is the vines which he uses and most of those go to development projects that are promoting orange fly sweet potatoes. So these women are harvesting the vines and bagging them up. Okay, I'm gonna go run quickly through, I'm not gonna say very much about these topics. Partly the reason is these are areas as much, I, I don't, I'm, I, I'm I've been in Montana for in this area for about 20 years, but I, I haven't spent a lot of time at the university. But these areas strike me as areas of strength as far as the University of Montana is concerned relative to a lot of the other areas. And the last item, uh, the last topic, monitoring and evaluation and impact assessment, there will be a course offered next semester in which I and Kimber McKay will participate in and you are cordially invited, some of you, I think if you qualify, I don't know. <laughs> but we had a good time last year. Uh, did anybody participate in that course last, last year? No, they probably. They probably all graduated. Yeah, they probably ran away. Yeah, anyway. Uh, this particular topic and all of these topics that we've gone through, but this one in particular, if you're looking for a job, if you're looking at something that is also transferable between development and the real world, monitoring, evaluation, impact assessment gives you the tools that are broadly applicable. 
Okay, now we're going to skip this. Oh, there's that guy. Okay, this is Mount Melange again. And unlike the women in the previous slide, I am not harvesting sweet potato vines. But this is me, and this is that's my wife, Susie, uh, who came out uh, and joined for the final month. Uh, this was last year when we were doing sweet potato. I was focusing on sweet potatoes. Okay, now this is where it gets pretty, you have to read this and think about it. Uh, this is from the report, which I think is an excellent report, excellent, uh, an excellent critique. And this, these two sentences uh, really capture a lot of the problems that I think are present in the Feed the Future program. I'll just read it through. While climate variability can be described as a crisis multiplier, the driving forces behind food security in Mozambique and Malawi are poor governance, resource capture by elites, and dependency on donor assistance. Who can, who can tell me what resource capture by elites? What the hell is that all about? Anyone want to take, take a chance at that? Resource capture by elites. Okay, let's take it down to the village. Yes. Just breaking it down, just like a disproportional uh, allotment of resources kind of based on status and income in the country. I mean, that the more money you have, the more access to natural resources you're going to have, whether that is clean air, clean water. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's good. Not necessarily it's your status, not necessarily what your wealth is. Wealth is wealth and status are often related, but at the village level, not necessarily. Yeah, they are, they can be. But basically the elites, and this elite you may think of somebody who owns a big hotel or something like that. No. Elites are also right down to the village level you have that term is used to describe the people who with power at the village level. So could they own more land or maybe have um, money to, like they don't need to work their own land, but they can hire workers to work, work there? Yeah, but that's not the way they capture. The way they capture, and that's more perhaps a kind of an indicator of whether you are an elite, but often it's the elites are those who are have power whether it's the village level or at the national level, those people have power. And usually it's associated with wealth, but it's more complicated than that. Uh, it's often political power, uh, which is once again often translates into having, being able to have access to resources. But basically resource capture means that resources including training, including seed, you name it. Whatever the services, goods and services. It's not necessarily money. The goods and services offered by a development project tend to get taken up mainly by the elites, by those people with power rather than the poor, poor people in the population. That's what elite capture is all about. And dependency on donor assistance, I think that's pretty obvious, uh, but this is serious, huge, and growing. Much more so today in Malawi than it was 30 years ago when I was there in the 1980s. And this is a serious problem. There's a number of reasons for this, but programs like Feed the Future perpetuate dependency rather than breaking that cycle. And Feed the Future is aware of that, but again, you're caught in a bind of producing results in a very short-term situation, as opposed to dealing with the other issues, such as the capacity, human resources and organizational capacity, which would give you, or the country, the ability to deal with a dependency, to graduate from dependency. So it perpetuates dependency, 
instead of creating a pathway out of it. Okay, donors must share a portion of the responsibility for failing to help governments address these root causes despite years of close engagements with their host and the disposal of large amounts of development and humanitarian assistance. Yes. And here, uh, why? Why, why? Because it's in the interest of both parties to do it exactly like this. That's where it gets bad. Okay, now that's the bad news. Now some good news. And that's what you have here. This is uh, a project that is actually not supported under Feed the Future, or at least the initial idea wasn't. Uh, but it was supported by a British uh, uh, assistance project called the Malawi Oil Sea Transformation Project. And basically the idea is very simple. You supply money on loan in the form of seed, not money, but seed, to farmers, in this case soybeans. You give them 30 kilos of seed. 30 kilos of seed plants approximately an acre of land. You plant an acre of soybeans. You have a fair number of soybeans. I don't know whether anybody can visualize that. But anyway, it's, a lot, it's more than you can eat. It's more than a family would eat. In other words, you produce enough so you can sell it. You can sell it and you can repay your loan. You repay your loan in seed to, and if you want to uh, sell more in addition to repay your loan to this organization, which is called the Agricultural Commodity Exchange, or ACE, they will be happy to take it, to find a buyer for it, or to store it. They will give you credit for any stored soybeans. So while they sell it, using the soybeans, stored soybeans as collateral, and so, what happens? You participate in the value chain. That's where this is all leading. And you make money. And actually, in a last year was a horrible year. Horrible year. Large failures in many parts of the country. But it's spotty. The areas, one district where this was uh, happening, and I visited the group there, uh, there were about 40, 50 members that participated in the program, took the seed on credit, and repaid 100%. This is a bad year, a bad year, and they paid. These are poor people. They repaid 100%. And they made money. And I won't go into all the details. Above and beyond repaying the loan, they made money because the soybean prices were high, were good. And... They loved it, and they came back this year for more. That's the basic model. I thought this was great. I uh, employed it in the project that I was doing, and I did because I didn't like a number of aspects that we were doing, which was more in the resilience and relief mode than it was in the uh, participation in the value chains. But this is not for everybody. It, it, most. This is for a minority of the farmers, let's face it. But it works. It's a tried and true model in Africa. It's not new. It's been used for wonderful things like tobacco and uh, uh, tea and coffee. The, those are a different kind of value chain, which makes it easier to kind of do sugar cane, another one. All of those, much more difficult with something like peanuts, where you can eat it or you can sell it wherever. Yes? Was the Chichumba model that you're discussing open to anyone or mainly just the elites again? No, good question. Uh, no, not just the elites, but uh, there was a fair amount of self-selection here. And if you one looks at the socioeconomic profile of those that participated, it was those who had enough land and could see and were willing to take the leap into specializing and putting a whole acre of land into soybeans, a crop that is not part of the regular diet. So they're going to sell 
all of it, virtually all of it they're going to sell. So this is, these are people who are oriented toward the market already. So yes and no. Uh, they are not the poorest of the poor. They are not so poor. So anyway, this is, this is an example of something that works in a situation where a lot of things don't work and where I think can break that cycle of dependency uh, and induce some farmers, not all of them, to participate. Okay, uh, this is uh, every day when I went from my residence, which was about uh, less than 10 miles from uh, my, the research station, and along the road, on, e on either side, no, no, just on my mainly on one side, I'd have these bicycles look exactly like this, loaded. And they ride these bicycles. And I, they're going like this. And I, oh, and well, I, I just, you know, slowly, slowly, slowly. <laughs> just day in and day out, they do this. And here they are taking the forests apart one stick at a time. And this is unfortunately what is happening. And this is the livelihoods. They, they will, they, these people will work, uh, uh, they work in teams and they'll work many hours a day. And they, they ride in the night and they work in the night and they work straight through. Just to haul the, uh, yes? Just to go back to the Chitumba project, hmm. do you think that USAID would be interested in replicating the Chitumba model? Yes. Absolutely. Have they started replicating? Yeah, and that was in, our, in the project that I worked on, which was integrating nutrition into value chains. But we were just focusing on the value chain portion of that rather than doing the nutritional part. And we were focusing on soybeans and groundnuts. And initially when it came out, and this was where a real conflict of objectives in AID's mind. On the one hand, they said, OK, we want you to encourage participation in value chains. On the other hand, farmers are starving. Farmers have no seed. Do a seed dump. I call it a seed dump because you just go out and distribute seed through humanitarian relief using vouchers or whatever. You just give them seed, basically give them seed. Make them pay a little amount, but basically it's a gift. And then it disappears. It's the end of it. And then they do, do, do the same thing the next year. Uh, now, there are certainly situations where that's justified. What I said in this case, and it re related to the nature in which we gave out the seed. Initially, they said, just use vouchers. I said, just, just free, just basically. And I said, OK, then I saw this, found out about this, and I visited this project. There was this woman. A uh, young woman called Lily from Belgium. And she was described as a miracle worker. I said, miracle worker. And I immediately thought of, and Teresa will probably know this one. Who would you think, when you use the term miracle worker, what comes to mind immediately? Jesus. Whoa. Yeah, that's. <laughs> Jesus, yeah, that's it. Okay. Mother um, Teresa? No, well, Helen Keller was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Helen Keller, and I, I, I don't know, I think most of you probably know the story of Helen, Helen Keller, but basically she was deaf, dumb, and blind. And then there was this person that worked with her and was able to communicate with her. And she was called the miracle worker, and they, it was a story and a movie and so forth. And I said, OK, this is good. I want to meet this woman who is the miracle worker. And so I met Lily. And she took me out to visit. Lily wrote this. Um, and, she, and she said, OK, I'll take you out and I'll show you how we're doing. I went out. Why is she a miracle worker? I said, what? This is, this, the concepts here are not new. There's nothing really new about this at all. 
What's, new, what's unique or new in this situation is that the farmer group, and this became evident, you just sit there and you look at the farmers who come in. These are men and women, most of them women. They believed her, they had trusted her. They've been through so much in terms of failures of implementation, this, that, and whatnot. But they trusted Lily to deliver what she said she would do. And it was very simple. And so they did what they said they would do. And namely, they took the seed, they planted it, they produced the crop, they came back and repaid their loans and more. They sold more and they made money and it worked. Yes? What do you think would happen if they couldn't repay their loans? Some of them didn't. Some of them and some of the other groups didn't repay the loan. That's a very good question. And I think there it is a matter of group responsibility to say, OK, what do you do in the event that certain members of your group fail to repay your loan? And I think that here is where you, and you're, the, the difficulty in a place like Malawi is you have such a history of not repaying the loans and being loan forgiveness, and there are no serious consequences. And therefore, people get in the mindset that it is a gift and we don't have to be serious about this. That's one thing you've got to break, because if you don't break that, they can never participate significantly in value chains outside of these development projects. Namely, they will be dependent forever. And the development projects are not going to be there forever. So in this Statuma model, then, I take it that they use kind of like the Grameen Bank, those borrowing groups. And if you, you know, if people in your group didn't repay, then you had to you know, either repay it yourself or kind of... Yes, yes. That was an internal... This is basically... Now, basically what we did, and I said... In, and first of all, we had some that were on this model. Yes. Uh, and that was, that was a minority. There were about 3,000 farmers that were going to participate in this, uh, take the 30 kilos, which is a lot. The rest were going to take 10 kilos. And those 10 kilos, I said, are going to be with groups and members of groups that in the estimation of the agencies, the NGOs, uh, the local uh, um, extension service, ag extension work, service, were good functioning groups and had a track record and were responsible and were serious. And that eliminates a lot right there. So basically, you chose groups that were functioning and had a record and wished to maintain their reputations rather than whatever. And I said, if we don't get enough of them, I don't care but get ones that are good. And then we visited each one of the groups, and we gave them, you know, they went through a, I visited some of them. I, I don't speak Chichewa, so I didn't follow everything. But they gave them a quiz. And basically, they ran them through. And this was a team of people from one from our project and two from uh, other partner projects, one including ACE. And they would quiz them, they'd ask questions, they asked about their histories and so forth. We wanted ones that already had been exposed to the improved practices. They were not neophytes. All of them are farmers, but some of them. And we went through and they did, and they asked them, uh, our team asked them questions and in some cases, and I had a whispering translation going along and I, I said, that guy that's answering all these questions, he could be a trainer. This guy knows everything. We don't have, there's nothing. <laughs> he, he, you know, in terms of a credit program, that's perfect because they already, it's not a question of acquiring additional technical knowledge. We're providing them with the inputs and a way to market output and they already have the technical knowledge to make it work. 
So that looked like a great deal, a great thing. Okay, so any more questions? Any more questions? Whoops. <laughs> anyway, I think our time is drawing close to the end. Well, I wanted to um, come and thank you for your help tonight. And um, if we could give a round of applause.